Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for coming today. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker in the Weissner Seminar, and this is Professor Wesley Browning. And uh, I would like to introduce him uh, with a few words. So, Professor Browning comes from Ireland, and uh, he uh, obtained his PhD in uh, Dublin City University. After this, uh, this uh, he had uh, one year postdoc between Dublin City University and Queen's University Belfast. And then he moved to Netherlands, to Groningen, where he worked uh, for two years as a postdoc with Professor Ben Feringa. And here I should mention Professor Ben Feringa is the person who received the Nobel Prize in Chemistry last year, and Professor Browning was his collaborator ever since. Uh, then uh, in uh, 2008, he uh, received uh, assistant professor in uh, molecular systems and interfaces. And uh, in uh, 2000. Uh, Thirteen, he got associate professor in functional molecular systems and catalysis and strength institute. Uh, in 2015, he became chair of the molecular inorganic chemistry and uh, chairman of the board of strength institute uh, for chemistry. Uh, and uh, he was uh, he received uh, many awards. And I should mention that uh, one of the most uh, notable awards uh, in his career was that in 2016 he was awarded with the Golden Docent, uh, which literally is translated the Golden Teacher, from the uh, Royal Netherlands Chemical Society. So today, uh, Professor Brownie will talk about the reaction mechanisms in inorganic homogeneous catalysis, where time uh, is of the essence. So thank you very much for coming today, Professor Brownie, please. Thanks very much for having introduction. Well, time is of the essence because I have to fly back to Tokyo this evening and then fly back to Amsterdam tomorrow. It's after the end of a, quite a wonderful trip with a group of 14 bachelor and master students going all around Japan visiting universities. I didn't bring them with me, so they're, they're not out in the car park somewhere. They're in Tokyo having fun today. I'm here having fun. Um, well, first, thanks for the introduction. It's, uh, it's very nice to be here. It's absolutely a beautiful place. I think the students will regret not coming here, so it's... Next time. But where do I come from? Um, this is the Netherlands, this is Groningen, this is the Dutch North Pole. It's about as far away from Amsterdam as you can get in the Netherlands. And it's famous for tulips and windmills, which are all here. And in this part, it's famous for dikes and polders, very, very flat fields. Um, we're also famous for bikes. And this is before they cleaned up in front of the station, but there's still as many bikes there. So I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about what's going on in my group. Um, I'm the sort of person who doesn't really know what I want to do. So my group works partly on molecular-based materials, mainly because many of the students want to do organic synthesis and want to do some measurements. And this is great for masters and bachelor students. Unfortunately, industry in the Netherlands likes to do this sort of thing, oxidation catalysis. So this is for fun and this is for money. But there is an overriding team, so when you have a group of people all working at the same level, spot the Dutch and the Thai, uh, spectroscopy and electrochemistry. So the core of my group is to look at things and get information out of the system and answer questions. And it doesn't matter if it's a molecular material, catalytic system, charcoal. We look at anything and we try and get as much information out as possible. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk a little bit about the work done by this, the smallest and probably the most uh, vociferous member of my group is a Thai student who just finished. And then I'm going to move on to talk a bit a little bit more about other chemistry that goes on. So I have three topics. I don't think I'll talk about all three topics depending on the time because it's quite warm and I'll find myself going slower and slower and slower. I'm not working at my optimal temperature range here in Fukuoka. It's about 10 degrees too high. So a key question that's often asked, and this is a buzzword which I'm pretty sure that you've heard all the time, is innovation. It's a word I hate. We have to generate more innovation. I don't know what innovation is. They also have another word in the Netherlands called valorization, which literally means the artificial increase in the value of something by government intervention. In the Netherlands, they think that valorization means you make things better value. So sometimes these blood words are difficult. But if you want to innovate in catalysis, how do you do that? Well, even if you don't know how to do it, you should come up with a solution. And the typical approach is from industry is you have a substrate and you want a certain product. That's how you innovate, you make the product. And if you're in academia, the paradigm in homogeneous catalysis, we have a great catalyst. What substrates can we convert to products? So there's two different ways of thinking. Well, 
I think that when you're asked to do something new and different, and you're asked to innovate, innovation doesn't come by a thought you have. Innovation comes by the doing. And if you want to innovate in catalysis, you have to focus on the substrates and the products. There's no point making a useless product or a useless substrate if you don't know what useful is. When I ask my industry colleagues what's useful, what makes money, I give up that. And a catalyst, well, you can do all sorts of reactivity with a catalyst, but is it useful? You don't know. What is useful is understanding the entire system. And to understand that, you have to understand reaction conditions as well. The reaction conditions, I say, is the catalytic system. To understand what is happening, to make any progress, to do anything new, first we have to understand where we are. Now, I, I like the term Pandora's box, because the last thing that comes out of Pandora's box is... Oh, good. Students also get that. They also hope in my head. So I have three major themes, and of course we have to do sustainable oxidation chemistry, which means we work on sustainable metals. Now, palladium doesn't seem like a sustainable metal, but it's very easily recovered. It's not that expensive either. Iron and manganese, because of the bioreligance. Um, we work on a lot of biomimetic iron systems for fun. They're spectroscopically very nice. Manganese is horrible. Spectroscopically, for most of the time, it's manganese too, and yeah, it's white. It's like zinc. But it is very useful. So this is good to look at, and this is good to use. And palladium, well, if I have time at the end, I'll show some innovation we've done with palladium, particularly with the Wacker reaction, which is important for Japan, I think. So start off, what does this small Thai organic chemist do in my lab? So she's coming from Mahidol University. She's a hardcore synthetic chemist doing total natural product synthesis. And I want her to become a physical chemist. So how do you do that? Well, you learn on an old bike, is the expression of Horningen. You don't take a new bike and wreck it. So we take an old bike, and this is an old bike she starts off. It's a very simple iron complex. It's got two phenols, which have been becoming important. It's got typical amine things, which you'll see as a theme in this talk. And if we look at my colleague Ben Fieringa, so when I was still in short pants, he was publishing on these things. He found that this complex, when you add, add hydrogen peroxide, you take an alcohol, you convert it to a ketone, 4% NMR yields. It's not exactly uh, exciting, but at the time it was a major result for iron chemistry because biomimetic iron complexes are all the rage then. But what was interested in this complex was because, well, it has some funny chemistry. If we look at the colour of the complex, you see the colour changes, it fades slowly. It goes from blue to colourless. And the catalysis is pretty poor. And eventually it starts going faster, and then it stops when the colour goes. So there's a, a correlation, not necessarily a causal relation, but there's a correlation between the loss of the colour and the increase in the catalytic activity. Now what's magic with this thing, and it's magic because we didn't understand it then, is when you add an acid like trifluoroacetic acid, this whole lag period, this slow phase, disappeared. And you get a very fast catalyst. So what's happening? So the very simple task I ever was, well, have a look at this complex, it's coloured. It'll give you a nice resonance Raman enhancement, so you get to learn resonance Raman, you get to learn electrochemistry, you get to learn how to do catalysis. It's a two-week project. And like most two-week projects, it ends up lasting four years in the PhD. So, why are we interested in these? Well, if I want to sell it, well, this is a, a typical motif you get, a tyrosine or so, some phenol unit in an enzyme, and that allows you to do redox on an innocent chemistry. So the, the phenol unit is redox active, that allows you to do two electron chemistry with a one electron atom. That's a nice way of telling why you would want to do it. Has it been done before? Well, these sort of ligands have been used quite extensively, and we have some design rules for these. If you take this series of ligands, which are solemn based, well, you get these terpene groups. And they protect. And what they've shown is that if you don't have these terpene groups, you lose your colour very quickly and you lose all activity. So these are this, and this is not active, and this is active for oxidation chemistry. So from the start of the project, we're thinking we want to design a new catalyst, we want to understand how a catalyst is working. Oh, the phenol catalyst that I showed you before works. Very simple question. Why does the colour change and what relation that has with catalysis? Okay, that's the starting point. This is the, the Beth Mavar of the study. And I ask a very simple question of the student. What is actually doing? What is it actually doing in catalysis? What happens? So the first thing you do is you run to a computational chemist, and they tell you exactly what's going on. No, the first thing you do is get some real hard data so that the computational chemist can actually tell you something useful instead of imagining for you. So there's two things that can happen. This complex can be doing catalysis and then die. Or it can die and then do catalysis. 
So is there a difference? Well, there's a difference if you want to design a cut list. If it's doing the catalysis and then dying, decomposing, then you can start thinking about design. If it's undergoing degradation, and then it does catalysis, then your design rules are anything you do with this ligand, you have to think about that degradation process. Some people call it catalyst activation. The big question is how do we find out? So what I'm going to do over the next few minutes is take you on a little bit of a tour over four years of how we figured out what this catalyst is actually doing. So, I'm going to break it down into three digestible sections. The first is protonation. The second is we take one or two equivalents of peroxide, see what happens. See what the initial stage is. And the third is dump in a load of peroxide and see what happens. So protonation results in, well, you protonate, you get a colour shift. Now what you notice is you get one bump here and you get two bumps here. These are ligand to metal charge transfers, very typical for phenol to iron 3. Nothing strange there. If you add water, it goes back again. So it's reversible. That doesn't seem remarkable. This is a reversible protonation. What you also notice is there's no isosbestic points. This isn't corrected for dilution. You can even see the signal of water creeping in. So what you would think is, well, you protonate, and maybe you protonate a second time. The question is, where do you protonate the first time, and where do you protonate the second time? And you might think that's trivial, but as I'll talk at the very end, when we talk about how this catalyst works, the protonation state here is, is a technical challenge when it comes to computing. I think it took a year to try and work out where it protonates, and the end conclusion is, well, the proton goes everywhere. So what is the effect of water? Well, we're going to use resonance for man. If you're not familiar with the technique, Raman spectroscopy is a, simply a vibrational technique. It's inelastic scattering of light. If you have a laser which is at the wavelength of an absorption band, you might, depending on particular conditions, you might get an enhancement of a very weak effect. So something which is present at very low concentration, suddenly gives you signals. So what we see is, take the complex in the nitrile, you see some very weak bands here. You have to believe me in here. You add acid, they disappear. And you add water, they reappear again. So adding acid and adding water is just it's a reversible reaction. Now that might not seem so strange. That gives us a feeling that we're doing this. Now why would we be concerned about this? The original hypothesis for the effect of acid on catalysis was if you add acid, you get a mononuclear complex. And the mononuclear complex gives you catalysis. There's no evidence in the data that we have that you actually get any mononuclear complex. You don't get any EPR signal, even at low temperature. But a back of the envelope ex experimentalist will say, well, with the back of an envelope experimentalist say, you add acid, you weaken that oxo bridge, and you get a mononuclear complex, you coordinate peroxide, and so on. But that's not true. What's more so, if we use re resonance for and we're looking at 785 here, we actually see the protonation has very little, has a small effect here and here. And this band here is from the phenol, but the rest of the bands are relatively unaffected. It tells you there's not much change in structure. Now there's also a, a result which later on became very important that we didn't notice at the time. We were concerned about the stability of the complex. So we decided to take a leaf out of the Buga Barrier studies and put terpene groups here. So the complex is more or less the same, except for the terpene groups. You get a blue shift here because you do a small twist in the molecule. But if you add acid, you see exactly the same shifts to this as you see with this. However, protonation doesn't result in an immediate change. It actually takes a little bit of time. And if the pro adding, pro adding acid doesn't result in an immediate change, it's slow, that means it can't be a simple protonation. You have to have a change in, in coordination environments. So that immediately tells us that protonation is not simply putting a proton here or here or here. It's causing a change in the environment. Okay. So, if we're talking about catalysis, we should look at what happens under catalytic conditions. And the first thing, well not the first thing, it was actually after two and a half years, of no sense. I asked the students, okay, can you add one equivalent of peroxide with acid? So in black here you see the original spectrum. You add acid, you get a shift. You add water, it goes back. And we add water because when you do it under catalytic conditions, there's a lot more water present. But it's still intermediate. And then you add peroxide. When you add peroxide, just one, one or two equivalents, you see a big increase in the band here. 
this rapidly decreases again, and then you get the appearance of another band here, which then decreases, and you effectively get no further change in the system. So, your imagination will start running. You think you're getting phenoxy radicals, you're getting peroxy species, and are forming. And one of the questions is, what are we looking at here? So we follow by time, and we see if we follow this band, we see an immediate increase and then a slow decrease. And just as this is almost coming to an end, we see an increase here. So that looks like this is growing up, it's decaying, and then afterwards this appears. So it looks like there's some other species in the middle. So we could come up with a model where we have a complex, we have peroxide, it changes to one species, changes to some dark species, and then changes to another species, and then goes back to the original one. Not quite what happens. If we follow by Raman at this wavelength, or at this wavelength, we can probe each species. We get resonance enhancement of, each spe of the Raman spectrum of each species, and very strong. And what we see is the Raman spectra we obtain at this wavelength, or at this wavelength, are very similar, in the sense that they have bands which are very typical of a phenoxy radical. But they're clearly not the same. They're clearly from different species. That's very useful. If we follow by Raman, the kinetics of both wavelengths, we see that instead of going up immediately and then falling off, there's a slightly different kinetics because of overlapping bands. But we also see that this appears immediately. The species responsible for this absorption appears immediately. I think this is... Battery's going in this, sorry. It appears immediately and then goes off slowly as well too. So this is a very different conclusion that we get from just looking at UV-Vis. If we follow the UV-Vis, we end up starting to make a model which is completely wrong. So not just doing kinetics, but doing kinetics with the right technique is important. Okay, we have an idea. If it's an oxy radical, we use an electron transfer oxidant, we should be also able to generate an oxy radical. So we add one equivalent of CAN, we start off with this spectrum, and we get an increase in absorption here in the, in the blue. But we also get an increase in absorption here, which you can pretty safely say that the changes we see there are not very similar, not as pretty as the changes we see here. So maybe we're getting different species. This is where the, the results get a bit more interesting. If you do a Raman spectrum at this wavelength or at this wavelength, we see that the species formed of CAN are identical to the species formed of hydroperoxide. The absorption spectrum looks different simply because of scattering, because of relative ratios of different species, not because there's different species formed. Now that's a bit of an insight. How do you take hydrogen peroxide, which is not an electron transfer oxidant, and do exactly the same chemistry and form exactly the same species as an electron transfer oxidant? So, then you, you, you sometimes get lucky in, in, in experiments. I wanted to get a nice cyclical tamogram because I wanted to know what the oxidation potential of this complex was. So I asked the student, if you want to do very nice electrochemistry on very unstable species, because in seat nitrile this looks horrible, in dichloromethane it looks better. So the trick is to go to dichloromethane, go at 200 Kelvin, your dielectric constant is better at 200 Kelvin than at room temperature, all chemical reactions slow down. You very often get very reactive species giving very nice electrochemistry and very reversible electrochemistry. So we do that, and we don't see very reversible electrochemistry. In fact, we see an oxidation, then we see a rather horrible looking bump, and then a relatively normal bump, and I think there's a good few electrochemists amongst you. Peak-peak separation here does not indicate a solution process, it indicates a surface confined process. You also see a decrease here, And if you keep going, you see a buildup on the electrode. So, what is that? Well, one of my other hats with molecular materials is electropolymerization. So as soon as you see this, you get electropolymerization. We're forming an electropolymer on the surface, so something's happening. So actually, it's a pretty well-known chemistry. You get the phenol, you oxidize to form a phenoxy radical. There's enough radical character disposition here to couple. You're going to form a CC bond. You lose two protons to regenerate a neutral species. This is the biphenol. And that, of course, is oxidized immediately at that potential. But then you can reduce it again, one or two electron afterwards. So what we're seeing here is this coupling process. But because we have a phenol here and a phenol here, it's coupling on one side and coupling the other. And the next one's coupling and coupling and coupling. You're getting long chains. 
So what we're building up here is something on the electrode. That's nice electrochemistry, but what has it to say for catalysis? So this is the redox processes you get for the first oxidation and the second oxidation. You get a semi-quinone and a biquinone, a doubly oxidized quinone. So cyclic photometry, uh, cyclic photometry of the electrode in monomer-free solution looks as it should do for a polymer on the surface. We see the first oxidation, second oxidation. If we do this on an ITO electrode or a platinum electrode, we get enough of a layer on there that we can actually st start doing Raman spectroscopy. We hold the potential where the red line is there or the green. And what we see is an absorption band at 870 when we have the monocadion and an absorption band in the, in the blue of the dicadion. Now, these absorption bands are quite similar to what we were seeing when we added peroxide or we added CAM. When we look at the Raman spectra and we compare them to the Raman spectra we're getting hydrogen peroxide or the Raman spectra we get with CAM, we see exactly the same spectrum. Now, the vibrational spectrum is a manifestation of structure. You don't get the same spectrum if you get a different structure, if you have a different structure. So what this shows is that the species which is on the surface is the same species we're forming in solution each time. So what's happening in solution? Well, we're oxidizing this complex, either with hydrogen peroxide or with cerium. We're getting CC coupling and we're forming these polymer chains, so oligomers and dimers in solution. The nice absorption bands we're seeing is simply the monocadion. In the first case, we see the dicadion of this appearing first, and then afterwards, slowly, as the solution redox potential drops, we get the monocadion. Now, what happens when we take the terbutin one? We shouldn't get that CC coupling. Now, this is the electrochemistry in acetonitrile, that's why I didn't go on to it, it looks awful. But if you had terbutin groups, you get two very nice reversible redox waves. So it is CC coupling. You can even get the, radical, the phenoxy radical signal, and you can generate the phenoxy radical cation. Okay. So the first step in the reaction, all the nice absorption bands we're seeing are coming from CC coupling, polymerization. Nothing to do with catalysis. So what happens when you add excess hydrogen peroxide? And this is where you have to be fast. The initial thing is to look at a reaction, you're going to follow it over several hours, so you're not going to acquire a spectrum every 100 milliseconds. You're going to acquire a spectrum every 5 seconds or 10 seconds or 20 seconds. Simply data overload otherwise. So we look back at this, the spectrum, when you add hydrogen peroxide, you don't see a steady decay over time. You see initially, when you have acid present, you see initially a jump. You get appearance of some bands here and the bands here, and then it goes down. And you get another band appearing here, which goes down very quickly afterwards. So this is over in about 100 seconds. So if you're following a reaction which takes an hour, or takes 10 minutes, or takes 5 minutes, if everything's, every, all the changes that you see here are over in 5 seconds, but the oxidation chemistry keeps going, it means the species you're forming here and the changes you're getting here have nothing got to do with your catalysis. So, again, Raman becomes useful. We look at what we get after 20 seconds or after a minute, we get this nice yellow complex. We look at this Raman spectrum at 355. We've lost this nice big phenoxy radical band or phenoxy band. What we get is a spectrum which looks almost identical to this complex. Now, X here is probably H. I'm not quite sure what it is. Our best guess is it's H. The spectrum here is what we expect of a complex which has lost that phenol unit altogether. So, what we've learned is over the first 20 seconds, we lose the important part of the molecule that we think will be responsible for catalysis. The redox non-innocent part. So, if you follow quickly by Raman, you get more information as well. So this is, uh, I think every 100 milliseconds or every 200 milliseconds we get a Raman spectrum. And what you see is appearance of a band of 1597 and a decreasing, so we're following a 785 which looks very similar to what we got before, except 1597 is not the wave number of the band that we got when we had one of the peroxide. This is when we had one equivalent to trifluoroacetic acid and one equivalent to peroxide, we get a band of 1608. The position is different, it's a different species. Now, you look at the absorption here, though we don't see a strong absorption here. And this looks quite different to what we had before as well. It actually looks similar to what we get with the terpubetoxy complex, or with the terpubetinol groups, where we only get a phenoxy radical. What it tells us is when we add excess peroxide, when we have excess acid, and we add excess peroxide, 
we don't get time to get all this coupling going on. We get immediately a phenoxy radical, and then that falls off. And what we're left with is a complex which is actually well known. We've used it before in a different project. Indeed, even if you have one equivalent of peroxide and you have two equivalents of acid, you still get this phenoxy radical, and then it dies relatively rapidly over 100 seconds. Two equivalents of acid is enough to stop this coupling reaction. And there's a comparison of the two spectra, so you see that they really are different. Now what happens afterwards? What's this? Well, we again turn to resonance Raman. The species persists a bit longer. It's probably more relevant for the catalysis. And what we see is very weak bands appearing, which are reproducible, even if they're weak. And they're very typical of iron-free peroxy, hydroperoxy complexes, which are very well known in the biomimetic community and quite well known in oxidation chemistry. In the reaction conditions, we also see a typical EPR spectrum for low spin iron-3. This is a high spin impurity, believe it or not. The signals are always much larger for the high spin than for the low spin. And that appears and disappears very quickly. Conclusion. Acid facilitates oxidation. It facilitates the interaction with peroxide. That's all it does. What is happening when you oxidize it with one equivalent of hydrogen peroxide or under sort of almost catalytic conditions where you want to see what's happening is you get the same thing as with electrochemical oxidation. You get CC coupling. When you have under reaction conditions where you use an excess of hydrogen peroxide, you oxidize this phenoxy, it falls off, cleaves off here, which is a known deep protection in organic chemistry. You get this sort of complex, which isn't responsible for catalysis, but this is a resting state, this dimer. So what do we learn? Well, if you want to understand how this catalyst is working in catalysis, well, this complex is not responsible for the catalysis. This complex undergoes a degradation to a relatively well-defined compound, which then does catalysis. So when you think about designing an oxidation catalyst based on hydrogen peroxide with phenol units, you might want to think that this linker here is probably a weak link and to remove it in design. But also, without this, it works as a very relatively good oxidation catalyst. Okay, so I'm going to shift onto something which is spectroscopically not so interesting. Manganese 2. And it's a completely different story. And it's again with a Thai student, a different one this time, and a Chinese student who are working together on this. And it involves this very simple ligand. So why I'm interested in alkene oxidation is because you can make epoxides. I told you, you need to make money in the Netherlands, you have to do something industrially relevant. And making epoxides for Rotterdam is very relevant. There's some huge plants there making epoxy resins. Dihydroxylation is also a bit of a challenge. Industrially, you have chromium or permanganate. There are some, some permanganate is the preferred one, and typically it's a mess. So they, typically in pharmaceutical industry, they avoid making diols in this way. They usually use Jacobs and Katsuki and use other routes to do it. There are some times when you need a diol. And one of the substrate classes which the Sharpless system really fails on are these electron deficient ones. So some scientists in Merck work pretty hard, and I had some good connections with them and discussions with them. They actually published the method for making a diol of an intermediate that they needed in the synthesis of pharmaceutical. They got 73% yield, which looks pretty good but it's 0.8 mole percent for thinium trichloride and 1.3 equivalents of sodium pyridate, which might seem like a problem when you recover the ruthenium, but try and get all the ruthenium out of the product afterwards. So they published this because it was a failed line. The question is, can we do better? Where do you start looking? You want to do a dihydroxylation. You've had Nobel Prize winners working on it over the years, and you're a student. How do you start? Well, you start somewhere. You start doing what everyone else is doing. So here's a set of ligand classes which are used in manganese and iron oxidation chemistry over the years. This is a very successful one. It was used for washing powder for a while. This one, this is now actually used in paint, by the way. So if you buy some paints from Axon Nobel and places like that, you use this one. Some other iron catalysts which are used now for paint drying and also for oxidation chemistry. But typically, the results under homogeneous conditions would be pretty poor for these catalysts. There's some recent work from the Costas group which is focused on these, which is really uh, in, in Spain, which has actually made a lot of progress on it, getting very high turnover numbers. But a few years ago, we started off, and I'm starting off my group, and students starting off to do oxidation chemistry, you need an idea to give to a company. Okay, we're going to start with these ligands, and we're going to make them cheaper, better, 
and we have a good lead. We have an alkene, make an epoxide. With this ligand and manganese, you can get up to 900 turnovers. And you have 700 turnovers of an alcohol oxidation. Well, that's nice. Manganese is cheap. These ligands are not really toxic. There's a little bit of a problem with data equivalents of hydrogen peroxide with, with acetone. So the problem with this catalyst is, well, you might say, well, you mix acetone and hydrogen peroxide. It's not the wisest thing to do, especially on an industrial scale. But actually, the problem is this. For the first part of the reaction, for several of these variants of catalysts, well, for between half an hour and three hours, the catalyst appears to do nothing in terms of converting the substrate. But that doesn't mean the catalyst is doing nothing. What the catalyst is doing is taking the hydrogen peroxide and making oxygen. Very vigorously. It's one of those reactions you don't want to repeat because it goes boom if you're not careful. Eventually it stops making oxygen and it starts doing its job. It starts making a conversion from amine to oxide. So, one of the questions I asked at the start was, what's it doing here? What happens here? What happens here? What happens here with the different catalysts? Now, there's only one way to find out, is to look. So we had some suspicions from mass spec that actually this complex was reverting back to its precursor, this aminol. There was an indication in mass spec that you get the aminol. However, you actually get the aminol from this sort of ligand anyway in the mass spec, so it's not, not really anything conclusive. But this is a precursor, and these are quite easy to make. The company we're working with wanted to have this library. So we tested one of them, and actually, yeah, it does two things. It gives you the epoxide and the dial and relatively good selectivity at the same performance as the original, but also electron deficient alkenes undergo conversion to diols, which is a useful reaction, with the same efficiency and conversion as the parent. So, students spend six months making all these things. And we can do a structure activity relation on this. So quite a lot of works. The student learned after a while that when you make shift base, you should do the reduction immediately and don't do workup. That's another story. We spent quite a lot of time purifying these, trying to make complexes, and eventually we just screen them all for a reactivity. And we found something which is quite remarkable. Probably you could say we could see that coming a mile off. As long as the ligand has this motif, has a pyridine. As long as it has that, it works. It doesn't matter what other spinach you have on there. But more importantly, it works exactly the same as all the rest of them. If it doesn't have that, it doesn't work. So even this ligand, which you would fail to see, you could think it's a tridentate ligand that's binding on like the TMTACN ligands that we use for Unilever. It's giving Mer coordination. You can imagine it's giving a few free sites. pretty good lead. It's also very cheap to make, much cheaper than this. So we check it, it works fine, and then the company we're working with, so it's okay, yeah, that's nice. Can you make it cheaper? Because these are this is an extra step. Could you make it in situ? So all the catalysts are working the same. There's no structure activity relation apart from you need a pyridine. We do a Friday afternoon experiment. So Anyone who's experienced in research knows what a Friday afternoon experiment is. It's usually about two years' work, if it doesn't go right. Around that time, I decided to invest heavily in Raman spectroscopy. We have a Raman station, which is built by a friend of mine in Belfast. It was subsequently sold to Perkin Elmer. They stopped producing it. It's a great, great instrument. It has a microtiter plate reader, which means you can monitor lots and lots of reactions at the same time. Unfortunately, for the biologist, you can use these plastic petri dishes. If you're doing organic chemistry, you got organic solvents, the dishes don't like it, so you have to spend a thousand euros on a quartz petri dish, or a microtiter plate. But it's a great, a great way of doing reactions because, yeah, you can follow a reaction. This is the information you get. Spectral is only a small part of it. You can follow substrate conversion, loss of, loss of hydrogen peroxide, formation of product, you get information about pretty much every major reaction component in one shot. And more importantly, if you think you realize you missed something in the reaction, you can look back at your data afterwards and pull it out. So we have thousands of spectra basically over the last few years that we can always reanalyze if we want to look at something else. But the most important thing is you've got an alkene band, and you can see if the alkene band disappears. That's a good indication that you've got your reaction, at least that the alkene is gone. It doesn't say the product is there. 
but it's a very quick way of screening. So one measurement, you can tell if the reaction worked. So it's a Friday afternoon experiment. We want to test the microtiter plate on the system, get the student more into doing more physical chemistry. So it's a very simple thing. We want to make this ligand. We want to make it in situ. So we take this amine, and we take pyridine aldehyde. You mix them together, it may form this in situ if we're looking. I don't see how it could happen, but that was the idea. So we do a screening table. We take only the amine, only the pyridine, we take the ligand, and the ligand with all the pyridines, and so on and so forth. So what we expect is this should work, because that's a positive control. These may work, because it depends how these interfere with the reaction. And maybe this should work. Nothing else should work. So we can tell. If it's worked, simply by the loss of the double bond, and we see that all of these work, and this works. Then we see that all of these have also worked, which is a problem, because here we only have this. So if we just take here in carboxylamide, no other amine or anything, it gives full conversion. And that tells you one of two things. Well, either you've got amazing results, or you've done something wrong. So you spend the rest of the weekend with the students, a couple of thousand reactions, and you work out what's going on. This is the ligand before the reaction. You take two, a volatile substrate with a volatile product, so you can evaporate it off afterwards. You look at your ligand afterwards, and you see that it matches exactly picolinic acid. You take all the other ligands, you do the same trick. You see they all go to picolinic acid. But of course, just because you get picolinic acid at the end of the reaction doesn't mean that that's what was doing it. If you start with picolinic acid, you forget everything else, you get two things. First of all, you can reduce the amount of peroxide needed to about two equivalents. And the second thing is the reaction starts almost immediately. And the third thing is you get no catalase, no hydrogen peroxide disproportionation. So a lot of work which is done over these years of manganese, with these type of ligands over the last 20 years, um, it's all been this. The problem is, we're still working with acetone. Now, I know a lot of work was done in, uh, in two pharmaceuticals in the UK, because when we reported this, I got approached by two of them at the same time, and they weren't happy. They wanted to know how long we were sitting on the results, because they spent about a million euros or so on the research, some ridiculous sum they might spend in the industry. But then you get this. You get a very nice result. You get an extremely cheap catalytic system. Very efficient. And the first thing you're asked to do is, can you do better? Can you replace the acetone and hydrogen peroxide? Because, yeah, acetone and hydrogen peroxide, even with two equivalents, that's still a very high concentration of acetone. It's not safe. So we do that. We check try a load of whatever ketones we have in the lab. We come up with three that tell us something. Trifluoroacetone, 30 volume percent, or even 0.3 equivalents with respect to substrate, give you almost complete conversion. So we can start using the ketone catalytically. The solvent is not just a magic solvent, it's actually acting, it's reacting in, in, in the reaction. But a strange one is trichloroacetone doesn't work at all. Touch it, sorry, hexachloroacetone doesn't work. Now if you've ever worked with trifluoroacetone, you know why it's, not, it's a pyrrhic victory. Just because it works doesn't mean you want to work with it. It's the most nasty vile liquid I've ever, I've ever encountered. It's just, just acrid. So, you get fed up after a while listening to companies telling you what to do, and at a certain point you say, well, you guys are the experts at screening, you go and do it. So we tell DSM, which is a, a huge library of compounds in, in, in Helene in the, the Netherlands, go look up. So they screened a lot of ketones, pretty much everything they have in the, in the, the building, and they came across this, butane dyne. And butane dyne is a smell of popcorn, it's the buttery smell of it, diacetyl. It tastes great. You can eat as much as you like of it, but there's one thing you shouldn't do. It's breathe it in. So if any of you are using vaporizers, you know these cigarettes that you vaporize? No? Good. Most of them have butane diamond and cause scarring of the lungs. It's called popcorn disease. So you won't notice it now, but if you start off when you're 18, by 45 you'll have cancer or something like that. So, but anyway, for reactions it works really well. It's extremely cheap because it's a fermentation byproduct. In fact, they dump the stuff. And it's actually, apart from the smell, which after a few days you really get sick of it, it works really well. In fact, so well, use 0.5 equivalents of it, you can use pretty much any solvent you like, as long as you have a homogeneous mixture. So dichloromethane or DCN doesn't work, simply because you get phase separation. If you homogenize it, it does. THF, you get full conversion, um, but you get no product, and that's because you get other chemistry going on with THF and hydrogen peroxide, so it's not every solvent. 
for pretty much everything, even methanol works. So butane dyne is an, a nice result because it's cost effective. We only need one or one and a half equivalents of hydrogen peroxide. We don't need to use acetone. And we have a full solvent scope. And that's important, and it became important about a few years later when a company asked us if we can do post synthetic modification of polymers. Well, if it works in any solvent, polymers generally don't dissolve, except when you use really crazy solvents. So we're able to jig around with the solvents and the conditions and get this to work even in pretty high temperatures and pretty nasty solvents. In fact, it works pretty good for a whole range of alkenes. Also does the diols. The one weird one is malleate. For some reason, that does not want to convert, no matter what. And that, that was about two years of trying to figure out why, and I still have no good answer. It does the usual substrate scope. We could do it 9 gram scale, 5 gram scale. And one of the major things we use for looking at the reaction is Raman spectroscopy. Every reaction we follow by Raman spectroscopy simply because it's cheap and quick. We could do large numbers of reactions, much faster than GC or HPLC, because actually to get this table on the previous one took us a day and a half, also with the analysis. So we simply took every alkene in the lab, we just ran under standard conditions, we checked by Raman if it's converted, if it's converted, check by NMR, boom. No GC methods or HPLC methods needed. What you see here is you see the CO stretch of the biacetal, you also have it down here, you see the peak coming up here which will come back to, you see your product appearing, you also see the peroxide disappearing and the substrate disappearing, so you get lots of information from the Raman spectrum. So we start following the reactions by, by Raman spectroscopy and we start noticing some strange things. The first is this. I talked about lag times earlier on. They're always a concern. It tells you well, what, what's causing a lag time, or actually what ends the lag time is important. But we still have a lag time, an extremely reproducible lag time. If you use the same conditions five years later, you get the same lag time. And then the reaction stops. And the reaction starts always with almost linear kinetics. So Hydrogen peroxide is added at one go. This isn't just a problem with continuous addition of peroxide. The reaction just proceeds, and it doesn't matter the concentration of the substrate. Now, we can follow the reaction by Raman spectroscopy. We can get kinetics. So we look at a substrate like this. We wanted to do, for another project, we wanted to, do this, we wanted to get this compound uh, at about 70 or 80 gram scale. I said, okay, we do a reaction 70 or 80 gram scale you're not brave enough to add that much peroxide to acetone because this was really only soluble in acetone for that, at that level. So what you do is you get a student who's you know, well, nearly finished their PhD, so they're out of time. You get them to do the reaction on bulk. You do it in flow. You take butane diamond and your substrate and your catalyst and everything else in this syringe. You take hydrogen peroxide and acetic nitrile. You run them through in a mixer and you collect your product afterwards. So you can do this on 60 or 70 grams per in a Mars spectra are almost identical, except that when you do it in batch scale, you get more impurities. And the reason you do is because you add all the hydrogen peroxide in one go and your reaction heats up violently. You get other reactions going on, aldol and so on. Remember, it's a ketone. Okay, the question is how does this reaction work? What do we know about mechanism? Well, we know how we get the glenic acid from all the amines, it's water under the bridge. We have a nice method that works. And this is our, our part of our reaction space. So, where do you start? What role does the solvent have? You see the gases, the organic acid, all the rest. You have to start somewhere. The first thing you just see is how critical everything is. So, you don't add manganese, no reaction. No pyridine carboxylic acid, no reaction. No butane dye, no reaction. And strangely enough, no sodium acetate, no reaction. So you need everything. One of the things that was proposed at the start is that you form paracetic acid in situ, because paracetic acid is quite good at oxidizing alkenes on its own. There's also a recent paper by Daniel Stack, who showed that paracetic acid with manganese and picolinic acid is very efficient at oxidizing cyclooctane and a few other substrates. But what we find is actually paracetic acid with cyclooctane is very efficient on its own, without any manganese or any picolinic acid. In fact, manganese and picolinic acid suppresses the reactivity. But for diethylfumarate, there's no reaction. And we can be pretty sure, based on NMR studies also, it's actually quite hard to form paracetic acid. You still have to check. The question is, what's butane dion doing? What is the role of the ketone in general? Because we started off with acetone, or butanone is also a fine, worked. And then we found that any ketone, or almost any ketone, worked. So butane dion works incredibly well. Very fast reaction. Instead of 24 hours, it's down to 5 minutes. What's its role? Well, first thing, what happens to the butane dion? 
Well, you start off with a butane dion, you add hydrogen peroxide, you immediately lose a signal in RAM for butane dion, which means you lose the butane dion. What you're actually forming is this adult. Now, in ASA, they actually make a lot of this every day in, in Axon and Bell's plant. So what's happening? Well, hydrogen peroxide and butane dion is in equilibrium with this adult. It's a very fast equilibrium, and it's also very much on this side. This is the major species in solution. This is almost non-existent. You see, depending on how much peroxide you add, you see you get almost quantitative conversion to this. And after a certain amount of time, the butane dion reappears once the hydrogen peroxide has been consumed. So you can follow this easily by UV vis, this is a nice yellow colour. So butane dion is forming this adult. That could simply be a reservoir or a resting state, but you always have at least two or three times that amount of hydrogen peroxide. So it's not that hydrogen peroxide is, is used up or is stored somewhere. Without the butane dion, it doesn't work. But one of the other things is lag time. This lag time is a strange. If you, had a, if you follow the reaction in black, you see that there's a certain lag time and then the reaction starts and then stops. If you add hydrogen peroxide and then you add acetic acid, the reaction starts immediately. If you add acetic acid beforehand and then hydrogen peroxide, it, it starts immediately. So what's happening in this lag time that you see under normal conditions is some of the butane dion has to convert to acetic acid and then the reaction starts. But it has, once you get beyond a certain threshold of acetic acid, adding more makes no difference. So, a few sample space, we have an idea what butane dion is doing. We know acetic acid is necessary, we don't know why. Solvent is not so relevant as long as it's homo homogeneous. Picolinic acid is necessary, and of course you need manganese, but manganese 2 or manganese 3, it doesn't matter. So I want to just say a little bit about kinetic analysis. I have a gripe with people who do mechanisms and run straight to do the, do the kinetics. The proper term, I think, is reaction progress monitoring. You just follow how the reaction is going over time. A kinetic analysis is something you should do at the end when you have a mechanism and you want to test, you want to falsify the mechanism. The worst thing you do is start doing kinetic analysis on data when you have no idea of the mechanism. But you should follow the reaction in time, and that's a very different thing. So when we're following the reaction, again, if we look at the substrate concentration, it makes no difference to the reaction rate. But the amount of manganese, if you go from 0.01 mole percent to 0.005 mole percent, the reaction slows down. Now we've done a lot of these, and what we find at the end, it's not zero order of manganese. I'm not going to say what order it is, because I don't know. And it is zero order with respect to substrate, but also hydrogen peroxide. So you can vary the amount of butane dion, and it has effect on the reaction, but you don't vary the amount of hydrogen peroxide as long as it stays above the concentration of butane dion, doesn't matter, doesn't affect the reaction. So we start looking at the effect of PCA, the, the, the pyridine carboxylic acid, and we see that the ratio of pyridine carboxylic acid to manganese is what's important. And this is very strange. We're going in some cases down to 500 nanomolar of manganese. And we still need three equivalents minimum of PCA. So if we start, for example, of one micromolar manganese and three micromolar PCA, and we increase to three micromolar manganese, the reaction stops. If we go from three micromolar manganese and we use nine micromolar PCA, the reaction starts. And that's very strange. At that low concentration, you cannot believe the association confidence is so strong that that would work. I don't have an answer for that. If you have a good suggestion, I would appreciate it. But what's important is that the manganese PCA ratio should be at least greater than 1, and preferably greater than 3. Okay, so what do we know about the mechanism? Well, precious little. But we do know some useful things. The first is, the reason why it's zero order is because this is what dominates the reaction rate. The concentration of this determines the reaction rate. It's one of the determinants. This reacts with the manganese catalyst, whatever it is, we think it's manganese 3, to form a species, which we think, I don't know, is manganese 5-oxo. And that manganese 5-oxo reacts almost immediately with either butane dion to give you acetic acid, or with the substrate to give you the product and butane dion back again. The fact that this is the rate determining step means it's zero order substrate, so we can understand why we're seeing zero order substrate. So, back to the first question. Can we do better than the team? I, I, I think it's Squibb or Merck, I've forgotten which. Well, we can. We take picolinic acid, take hydrogen peroxide, a base, acetone at room temperature. 
we work through it a little bit more, and we go from conditions where you get 73% yield with ruthenium, 0.1 mole percent roughly, to piclinic acid and manganese in acid at room temperature, and we get 91% isolated yield. And we can do this on large scale. Now, what they don't say about this is you get a lot of horrible side products in that root with ruthenium. The isolated yield is simply the mass loss by isolation of a large amount. We don't see any other products. It's a fairly clean reaction. So, and I'm on 15 minutes. Um, talk about iron and talk about manganese. I have a similar story about palladium. Um, given the time, I'm going to give you the punchline. Oh, should I? 48 minutes? It's very warm for me as well. <laughs> We can, we can stop here. Okay, well, I have to go to some conclusions yeah, as well. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Can we get the punchline? Yeah. Okay. You want the punchline? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, I don't know. It's a sort of punchline. So, one of the areas of, of research in the group for a few years, we're still trying to get it going. Again, with new students, of course, once a student stops, the project stops. I only have three or four students in the group, not a huge group. So take an alkene and do something with it that's a bit strange. Normally, if you do an oxidation with a Wacker oxidation, so palladium catalyzed oxidation, you get the Makovnikov product. So what we tried to challenge the students to do was to get the anti-Makovnikov product. And in particular, for protected allylic alcohol, because you wanted to get these beta-hydroxyaldehydes, because you can functionalize them afterwards and all sorts of things. And also, beta amino acids or beta amino aldehydes because if this is protected you can do all sorts of chemistry on here. Um, but the punchline is it works really well. And it's a very simple one. You take the non-classic Walker oxidation conditions. You just take palladium, you take benzoquinone, you take terbutanol, a bit of acetone, and you can start off with this linear lake alcohol, or you can start off with the branched one, and you get the same product. So, four. So the question is, how do you get there? Well, you get there by doing things which you shouldn't do. So you know the answer, yeah? The end of the result is that we get it to work. Okay. So this is where it started from. It started when again, a colleague was working in Shell. Shell were very active in trying to get down to Makovnikov oxidations. And they figured out that under non-classical Wacker or Suchi conditions, if you use terbutanol and oxygen and copper chloride, you can get styrene to give you selective anti makovnikov which is unusual because it shouldn't happen. It didn't work in any other solvent. It doesn't work with any other substrates. An early result using pretty similar conditions in DMF, these are classic Wacker Suchi conditions, if you protect a beta amino alcohol with talonite, you can get the product and you can get very good selectivity. Now this might seem, okay, well why would you give a student a project that's already been done? This is a useless result. How do you get this off? Without killing everything, chirality and everything else. So it's a great reaction that shows it works, but it's a reaction which shows, well, it doesn't work. No matter which other protecting group you use, it doesn't work. But what was important in the earlier work was this terpeno. So at the same time Bob Gross was working on this with styrene, so we started working on it as well too. And he published before us on the benzoquinones. Well, I gave the student a challenge. Do a palladium, benzoquinone, and get rid of DMF, copper chloride, and oxygen. Because she spent a year of her PhD, wasted it, trying to get the reaction to work using standard conditions. So if it doesn't work, stop. Do something brave. So she just tried it, and it worked. It gave her the Makovnikov product, which is exactly the one we didn't want. So, but at least she got a result she could latch onto. She tried a few protecting groups, and she got a little bit of anti-Makovnikov product. 
then she tried just Esther as a protecting group. It was the last ditch, and then she got her product. But, yeah, it was more than two minutes. Okay, so this is the key, and this is a trend I want to, to give for all, the, all these systems. If you do your product analysis carefully, you'll see two, two things. First of all, you get good antimicrobial cough ratio of 8 to 10. It's not wonderful. But also, you get two impurities, 10%, less than 10%. Now this might seem a problem, but it's less than 10%, it's no problem. Just call them out. The problem is this. For some substrates, you get full conversion. You get mainly this, but you get about 50% side products. So when you're wondering why to do a mechanistic study, we can do it for two reasons. One is to, for scientific curiosity, and the other is to fix problems. If your system works perfectly, a mechanism is just scientific curiosity. A mechanism comes into its own, and the importance of understanding how reaction works comes into our own when things don't work. And in this case, this is a big problem. We get lots of this. And why? Well, if you follow the reaction by NMR, and you have to trust me on this, you, you think it's a very slow reaction, it takes 36 hours, but actually the reaction goes with a big spurt at the start and gives you the product. But it also gives you something else. It gives you a side product in a very large amount. But at the end of the reaction, the side, the side product is almost non-existent. And I think this is a nice example of the curtain handle principle. We start off with this. We get a relatively fast reaction to here. But we also get in a, a palladium catalyzed isomerization. If this is a phenyl, then you really give a deep pit here. And you stabilize this. So for any, any substrate which is a phenyl group here, this reaction mechanism is, is a bit useless. Okay, that's a disadvantage. Can you turn a disadvantage into an advantage? Well, in order to make these, it's the ping and the butt. These are easy to make. If it goes this way, it's an equilibrium. You can also start here and go back and create an opportunity. You can start with the linear alcohol and get the branch products. Now, that saved the student a lot of work simply because she was looking at how the reaction was working. Now, there's another bit of magic in this reaction, and that's the role of terbutanol. There's been quite a few papers from other groups, Grubbs Group is one of them, and also initial results with, with terbutanol. It's a magic solvent. When you have something which is magic, means you don't understand why it works, this reaction only works in terbutanol. And the reason it only works in terbutanol is because you don't look at the reaction properly. If you take this and you do an oxidation, you expect to get an aldehyde, you expect to get a peak around 9, 10. If you don't get that peak, you don't have your product. Would you expect to get this? And if you've got a mess of peaks, it's very easy to miss this. But it started off when the student was working with a postdoc and the postdoc couldn't re reproduce her results. The postdoc was not getting the aldehyde. It's getting this. Now, if you've ever made an acetal, they're not trivial to make. You certainly don't make them a methanol at room temperature by stirring. In fact, if you start off with the aldehyde product, you get it back again with methanol. With terbutanol, you always see the product you want. With methanol, you always get this. This is actually forming in the reaction. What you do is you work it up with water, and you get your product again. Okay. So, I come to a conclusion. A minute over. Um, what I hope I've shown you today is that with three systems we looked over the years, our main goal is to get reactions to work, because that's what industry wants, and also that's what I want as well. But one of the things I have a pet gripe about is innovating in catalysis. I think if you want to do what people are actually asking you, the funding bodies asking you to do with innovation, what they want you to do is good science. They want you to actually work something that works. But I can't write in the grant proposal that any of these projects would have worked. If I proposed I was going to make all those ligands and then magically I would discover it's picturinic acid which is doing the work. Or magically discover that half my ligand fell apart and then I started doing the catalysis. Or magically discover that terpenol is not magic, it's just a solvent. You wouldn't get the funding. So, I think that's a little bit of a problem with, with, with modern funding, is that we have to pretend to be innovative. But while you're pretending to be innovative, it's also, I think, if you're doing catalysis, to take an approach where you don't look at what you want, the product, 
or to get a particular substrate to convert, or to get a catalyst, your catalyst, to do a, a nice reaction. It's good to look at everything that happens in the reaction and try and understand that the things that are going wrong, you can actually learn lessons from. And the results that you get can allow you to innovate and get new reactivity that you wouldn't have expected at the start. Of course, there's always hope. So, I hope the chemistry was hot for you. I realize it was very hot here. I'm sweating like hell. So, I have to thank a few people. Um, Don Penn was the first part, and these are a great group of international students. Cronin is quite an international university. We have an English bachelor and English masters, and about 50% of our PhD students are from all over the world. Um, I have a few Dutch students now as well. You can spot these two here are Dutch. This one's Dutch, and then as you go along the line, this is a cutoff for Italy. And afterwards, you go around the rest of the world. Uh, great group of kids. Um, good funding from the Netherlands, from NVO, the Dutch Science Foundation. We also have a, a research centre, which is a virtual centre. It's not in one location, it's over three universities. But it has a similar aim and a goal to do something different, as you have here. Um, and funding from the ERC as well. And, uh, yeah. Sorry, I went on to 59 minutes. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thanks.